Welcome to Building the Future, hosted by Kevin Horick. With millions of listeners a month, Building the Future has quickly become one of the fastest rising programs with a focus on interviewing startups, entrepreneurs, investors, CEOs, and more. The radio and TV show airs in 15 markets across the globe, including Silicon Valley. For full show times, past episodes, or to sponsor the show, please visit buildingthefutureshow.com. Welcome back to the show. Today we have Grant McDougall. He's the founder and CEO at Blue Ocean. Grant, welcome to the show. Thanks, Kevin. It's great to be here. Really appreciate the opportunity to spend time with you. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on the show. I think what you guys are doing at Blue Ocean is really innovative and cool. But maybe before we get into all that stuff, let's get to know you a little bit better and start off with where you grew up. Yeah, it's a it's a long story. Uh, born in South Africa. Uh, okay, cool. Raised in Australia. Interesting. Um, uh, moved there in about 1978. Wow. Um, did most of my education in Hong Kong. And then okay. was brought back to Australia and did my my kind of my tertiary education. My dad sent me to university to be an accountant. Um, okay. and I was like, that's that's then the internet arrived in about 1995. Uh, I was like, oh my God, this thing's gonna change the world. And I want to be involved in it. So I left university um Interesting. to get straight into it. And so I think that was the 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 very start of my entrepreneurial journey. You know, I I, I saw something; it was inspiring, and I I wanted to be involved in it. And um, and so you know, it was it was just a, a great a great moment. No, very very cool. So, like, did you you had no desire to be an accountant whatsoever? Like, nothing got you passionate about it. Well, I mean, I I love business, right? So okay. I, I I actually went to do a bachelor of business. Um, and you know, I've always been interested in economics, um, and the, the kind of the art and science that, sure. you know, that ultimately, um, business is all about, you know, it's about people, it's about, you know, kind of making sure that you've got, you know, good product market fit and then, you know, how do businesses work in the ecosystems that they exist? Um, and I, I got that pretty early on and, um, I've always been uh, involved in one shape or form in selling, um, connecting people, um, you know, from my earliest days in you know, doing paper routes. And I've always wanted to, you know, be involved. And so um, I think that work ethic was was built into me. Um, I think the formal education was was necessary for critical thinking. But, you know, I wanted to apply it in a meaningful way. And so I saw that really early on. And, um, it was, it was just fantastic that I could, I could grab it, um, with two hands. No, very cool. So walk us through your career up until blue ocean, and then let's get into kind of how you came up with the idea and then what exactly is it? Yeah, totally. Um, so in Australia, um, I got involved in, uh, in the internet, as I was saying, um, and I got to work with a company called spike, which was Australia's first digital um, really its first digital company working with a guy called Chris O'Hanlon. Um, we did work for people like Qantas, you know, taking their big AS 400s and scraping them and turning them into, you know, basically customer facing applications. Um, and it was, it was just really interesting to see the transformation from it to something that had an experience on it. That wasn't a green screen and, um, you know, was locked in a, in a cupboard and, um, you know, we, we really got the notion of, you know, building websites, uh, creating experiences, um, that company floated, uh, in a, in at the early, uh, late 1990s, uh, early 2000. Um, and so, you know, we were on the, the, the burning kind of platform of, of the internet at, at that time. Um, we, we were lucky enough. We got to work with people like Toyota. Um, we, nice. and, ended up building, you know, all of their dealer management systems, you know, early commerce engines. Um, and you know, it was a, it was just a really exciting time to, to really be connecting to, to companies and brands. I got a, I got a real passion for that. Um, I understood that, you know, that it was about the impact that you could have with consumers. Um, we started to get more of an understanding around the marketing side of the house. Um, 
and then I, I got the opportunity to to do a project called Spike Radio, which was a um, co partnership with with Toyota, and it was nice. you know back in the day, if you remember, real streaming and real media. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, we built the first 24 seven online radio station, uh, oh, in, cool. in, uh, LA, we built the studio, we, you know, all the distributed networks. Um, so, you know, when we took working with people like Cisco and, you know, really large, um, replicated networks to, sure. get, it was crazy. And it was like, that's awesome was, though. Yeah. It was like, you know, building infrastructure that hadn't been built and, for use cases that, that, that didn't, no one had seen. And so, um, that was really exciting. Uh, we quickly realized that you can't enter the U S market with, uh, about $15 million. Um, and we, we went back to Australia and, uh, it was a, it was a good learning, um, for me as a, as a young, um, a young, a young guy trying to, you know, really bring products to market and to, to enter new, new markets. Um, I ended up at a, a company called Motor Media. Um, okay. I went to Europe. Um, you know, like every Australian, I wanted to see the world. Um, cool. And uh, I was in London and you know, ended up running the HP business um, yeah, for in about 37 markets. Um, it, it was just awesome. Modem was a, a really forward leaning company. You know, they invented the banner ad. Um, oh, they were trying to bring uh, the connection between consulting and creativity to to bear, but with with big digital technologies. Um, and so I was there for about six years, um, and then you know digital consolidation started to happen. So you know Digitas bought Modem Media. Um, so I got to work with a guy called David Kenny, who's now the CEO of Nielsen, um, inspirational leader. Um, I, I, you know, ultimately got into a, a role where I was running HP globally. Um, and so, and so, you know, I was, I was in markets like San Francisco and Singapore and really trying to connect, um, across, um, markets and geographies. And it was, it was inspiring to me. And I, I, I got the opportunity to spend a lot of time in San Francisco and I just realized that I wanted to be closer to this, uh, intersection of design technology and innovation and you know when you're working on you know really large you know sort of enterprise it brands people like hp and ibm and all of those folks you you get a a passion for it you know to to make things and build things um so you know super exciting um and from there i i was involved in you know helping you know compact merge in with with hp no oh, interesting um, bring that brand to market, um, help them to, to go, you know, really build digital capabilities, um, inside their businesses. So, you know, when search was just emerging, bringing that inside, um, digital production capabilities, all, all of the things that we, we take for granted. Now we, we were building from the ground up. Interesting. And, um, so that, that was, that was the formative years. Then I went into uh, the media side of the house, um, after, you know, many, many years in digital, um, I ended up a place called Cara, um, and now part of the Dentsu, uh, Dentsu network, okay. um, working on the Fox business. And so I got to, to launch movies and oh, I, interesting. That'd have been fun. Dude, it was awesome. You know, so I, I was down in LA, I did worked on avatar. I got to work with some really smart, um, creative people, uh, in the studios, people like Bettina Sherrick. Sure. And, um, you know, it was, it, it's a completely different marketing model. You know, we've spent our years building brands over time. When you're making a film and you're launching it, you get one shot. And so, you know, you really have to, you know, you know, make sure that you've got your media mix right and how you introduce it. And so it taught me the, you know, the ability to get attention quickly and then sustain it, um, over time through, through other assets. Um, yeah, after that, uh, I ended up working at a place called Level, which was doing a lot of the double black projects for Apple. Oh, cool. um, and um, it was just a, it was a great company. It was, it was, you know, we're in the right time at the right place, um, thinking about you know, design thinking and, um, you know, really UX. And that was the ability to bring the products to life in a, in a new way. Um, but I've always had a passion for, you know, kind of the creative and data side of the house. Um, right. 
as part of that that work, we started doing things like building, um, you know, what we called customer engagement engines. And essentially, what they are, they they were early customer data platforms, you know, okay. and and so we we went out and we had you know really had a, a strong consulting bent in the business. Um, we connected, you know, personality based segmentation with data sets and then the inputs and outputs um, to really drive action. And so I, I really started to understand the, the, you know, the connection point between uh, what was happening in the digital ecosystem and then ultimately what was happening, um, you know, through the data and ultimately what, what actions you could take. And, you know, we worked with people like Activision. So you can imagine, you know, we, we marketed sure. uh, the Call of Duty franchise. Oh, interesting. And we were doing things like, um, you know, if you think about going from one um, franchise to the next, it's really hard to retain people. And it, that's, that's the objective, right? So and if you use data to do that, how would you do that? You know, so you, you've got to be able to understand, you know, what's, a, what's a, an experienced gamer look like? You know, when, when do they defect? Um, you know, and we started to observe behavior. Like if I shoot you in the back of the head when I'm playing Call of Duty, it means I'm getting bored. And so we, we started to inject experiences into the game based on data in real time. Oh, um, interesting. You know, like bacon wrap guns, right? So that, that sounds, it sounds, <laughs> ridic sounds ridiculous, but, um, you know, for, for an avid user of that franchise, uh, it was something special. And then if you were an inexperienced user, um, and you kept getting, you know, basically shot. Um, at the end of the game, we would we'd ultimately send you either an email or an SMS with assistance, and so that that really drove retention uh, into that franchise, and it was really really valuable. And so it's those moments that have really started to to spark my 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 imagination, um, and I I knew that you know the combination of data, uh, technology at scale uh, could could be applied to marketing, which had, you know, largely been a pretty analog instinct based, uh, approach. And, you know, customers have been buying, you know, 5d processes like discover, divine design, deploy <laughs> for, right. yeah. for, for years. And I was like, God, like, you know, we've got to, we've got to do better than that for, for companies. Um, you know, otherwise we're just going to fundamentally erode trust. Um, and that's, what's happening. That's happening right now, you know. So you're, you're looking at agencies and consultancies. They're they're doing mass consolidation. They're having a really hard time, you know, building preference and sustaining relationships inside inside those businesses. You know, think about 1950s, right? You you had yeah. ag agencies who had huge relationships and they were strategic partners because they were deeply invested in their their, their you know, customers' businesses. We're now in a commodity business for creativity, for media, for uh, all of those elements. We've had procurement come in and drive cost down to a place where really these, you know, large holding companies have a really hard time in actually driving any sustainable revenue and therefore they are not that interested in, in the actual business. And so they look to, to drive margin um, out of and cost out of the business rather than driving outcome. And I, I, I realized six years ago that enough is enough. Uh, you know, I was pitching business and winning business. I wasn't doing the business of my customers and I wasn't serving my customers. And so um, I set about you know, starting a company called Black Belt, which was, um, you know, the notion of that business was to bring data and creativity together, to use software defined principles to accelerate outcomes. Um, and as part of that process, um, we discovered a method um, to you know, really understand the and shorten the cycle um, of strategy and to get to value, to the answer much quicker. And so uh, we piloted that on a, on a couple of clients um, like NerdWallet uh, here in San Francisco. Interesting. And we went, wow, that, that, that really needs to be technology. And you can't build technology in a service company. And so, you know, we'd, we'd seen that. Um, through my experience, my my years, as well as my the co-founders um, in Blue Ocean, so we took that business, um, we took the product, and you know ultimately spun it off into Blue Ocean. Um, we we raised two rounds of funding um, in you know basically a seed and a, um, a you know pre-seed, um, so we got about five million dollars of funding behind the business, 
Wow. And we set about, you know, building a platform and we had the notion that, look, we want to build this in concert with our customers. Um, and we want to really, uh, democratize the notion of strategy. So, you know, if you imagine, you know, the 20 years that I'd been spent in the industry, it was, you know, building competitive advantage for these global brands, you know, actually, you know, building blue ocean, blue ocean is a really a, a system and a platform for taking action, you know, and ultimately we, we knew that to do that, um, you, we had to really invest in, in infrastructure and we had to be unburdened by um the outcomes and so when you think about you know a service company or an agency or a media company they work on behalf of the customers and what we really wanted to do was build a platform that could ingest data um, and i'll talk a little bit about what the what we do and how we do it sure um yeah and then ultimately be able to provide that um you know in a very independent way without a vested interest in the outcome so you know if you want to think about us in a simple way, it's it, it's McKinsey meets McCann in a click. That's ultimately what we, we we set out to do. Um, you know, we've really been focused on democratizing strategy. You know, that's been the bastion of um, people that could afford McKinsey and Bain and BCG. Uh, we think everyone deserves that. Like, and you know, ultimately, what this is about is if you can get access to the data um, and you know, the platform can provide the expertise. Um, we can all compete at a higher a high level. And so um, we've been focused on doing that. It's a, a really simple process. You put a URL in and your competitors, um, and then the system goes out and ingests uh, a variety of data. And it looks at um, you know, how much is uh, you and your competitors spending, um, how much traffic is being driven to it, what's happening with their content, how differentiated are you? relative to that competitive set that you're trying to take market share from. Um, how consistent are you? You know, uh, is your message clear? Do people understand it? Um, does, uh, do you do it in a way that, you know, ultimately builds preference um, using frequency? Um, and then, you know, ultimately, you know, what, what is the personality of the brand? And is that consistent across channels, which has been really hard to, hard to measure. Um, within sure. couple, yeah. And then we couple that with, um, you know, really, are you driving growth? Healthy brands grow, right? And so they, they're right. getting, they're getting market share. They're, um, they're, they're growing at a disproportionate rate to their competitors. And so we've built in a lot of the econometric measures, um, to make sure that we're connecting, you know, brand equity with, with growth. And then the last piece is, you know, we, we looked at MPS and MPS for us, we wanted to put it into a situation where we weren't um, asking a customer a question, what we were doing was actually looking at the behavior, um, of customers. So we, we look at their sentiment, what are they saying? Um, you know, what, are, how much time are they spending with the brand? Uh, we look at consumers, um, and their response, we look at their employees and we, we look at their newsworthiness. Um, and that ability gives us the, um, an, an understanding of a brand fairly holistically from, you know, is your marketing and advertising working? You know, we call that familiarity. Um, you know, are you differentiated? We call that uniqueness. Um, and then consistency is, you know, all of the marketing excellence. Are you doing it well? Um, are you growing? And then do people actually care about your brand emotionally? And um, when you can do that, you bring a quantitative measure to, to brand. And people have been really, really, they're desperately looking for that because it's been it's been instinct based for so long um and you know ultimately we 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 wanted to bring that to the mid market uh, as part of the journey we we got to know microsoft uh, early on and they were like we've been trying to do this for years you know we have we have longitudinal brand tracking uh, they have one of the best brand trackers out there um they actually go out and you know ask people and it decision makers all about um, how that, what their perception of the brand is, but they, they didn't have a high frequency version of it. And so, um, what they were like, this is something we've been trying to do. Um, uh, we were like, wow, that's really interesting. Um, we were going after the mid market and, you know, we've really started to get some real traction. So people like, you know, Google, Microsoft, Cisco, yeah. Juniper, 
um, you know, we've, we've gone pretty deep, um, and we, we go across category. So we've had, um, you know, people like Panda Express, uh, come into it and perhaps America's favorite beer. Um, you know, and yeah, then that, that, that's been really, really rewarding, um, to, to, to actually build in concert with clients and for them to use it to, to drive decisions. No, that that's very cool. So this might be a stupid question, but I think people are probably wondering how do you actually get that data about, say, my brand or or Google or Microsoft or or anybody out there? Yeah. So you know, we we've spent the the last eighteen months really focused on data ingestion. Um, and if you think about you know what brands do and what you do. You often you'll make comments uh, in social. Uh, brands yeah. spend somewhere between two and nine percent of total revenue on marketing, and what do they do? You know, they make websites, TV commercials. Um, they spend money to promote those those ads. Um, you know, they actually do that on a fairly regular cadence, and so we measure that. Okay. Um, and then ultimately, we're looking at their revenue performance relative to their to their competitors. Ah, and, so, okay. and so everything that we do is a, a relative measure. We take a market sort of econometric view of, of brand, which is a, a fairly different approach to um, how traditional research would, would approach this. And so you know, we're building a data asset um, by going out and scraping the web and looking at what publicly available data is. And then we're triangulating it uh, across a, a number of different sources. Interesting. Okay. So you guys have been, you've been doing this a long time and obviously the market and kind of what people expect has changed tremendous in, in a, even a short period of time. Um, I know like Apple's been kind of pushing the privacy stuff and we don't track you and, and, and Google just announced this week that they're going to, kind of track you less or, or personalize the data less. And, and I know other companies are in this space as well, but as for myself, I'm fine giving away some of that privacy because I like some of the, you know, features and functionality. Like if I go to a place and it pops up and says like, Oh, we recognize you're here and you can get a coupon or whatever. Like I like stuff like that. I'm fine giving that away partly because I don't think like I, I see the pros in that. I know other people don't. And then there's a bunch of people in the middle, but how do you guys focus on privacy for people that really want it? And then somebody like myself that is willing to give up some of that for some of the functionality and features that I get with giving that up. Yeah. It's a, it's an, it's a great question. And when we think about privacy, you know, you just got to have double opt-in. So you got to have the ability to say, look, I want to, to be a participant in, in this network. I want to know that I'm being tracked. Um, and if I'm okay with that, you know, great, you know, you enable more features in applications. Um, so you can have things like location-based tracking and you can have, you know, cross device and, and cross platform um, interactions, you know, if, if you're aware of that, that that's awesome. And it's great. And it's a service. And I think it's, uh, there's a, there's a value exchange between what you're giving up to get, um, that additional experience. W what the problem is, is when you, you get into situations when you don't know you're being tracked. Yeah, that's and, fair. And, you know, your, your Alexa starts listening to you right. and, uh, your smart TV starts listening to you. And your your nest knows that you're home, and uh, we then use that to create audiences based on that data, and then target communication at you. Um, that that becomes a bit spooky, and totally. so <laughs> um, we don't, I, I think you know ultimately um, consumers will choose. You know, so when when actually we get into a situation where you know some of the things like you know, not being retargeted and not getting good recommendations start to happen. Um, they're going to start looking for that. And so, you know, we get back to this notion of contextual based marketing and where have we seen that before? You know, we saw that in 1950s, right? Yeah. Interesting. And so, you know, we have been building a, a platform knowing that this was coming to 
allow marketers to really take advantage of that. So there's no cookies or there's privacy sandboxes or there's um, a change in the way that we track you around cross device. Marketers still need to be able to measure the impact of their, their marketing and advertising. And right. so, and so uh, what do you do? You know, you go back to more traditional measures of familiarity and um, awareness and consideration because you have to use those. And so we're, it's going to be, I think, an interesting renaissance for um, some of the big media um, sort of publishers and you know, some of the the more traditional content providers, um, because that's the way you're going to be able to target people is through through the media environments where they consume. And so it's, it, I think, it's a really exciting time. Um, I think it's a, it's also signalling a, a rise of brand uh, and brand marketing and brand approaches. Um, but it will bring, it will come with a digital, uh, you know, sort of a digital enablement, like a, a new way to do it. So, you know, I think you would have seen things like cross hashing and, you know, integrations of your CRM databases into, into audience development. You know, that's still going to happen. Sure. Um, it's probably just not going to be as targeted. Yeah. It, it's interesting. Cause like, I, I understand both sides of kind of. I want all the privacy and I want, you know, none of the privacy. The the thing that I find interesting about it is it seems like no matter what spectrum you're on, people will obviously want the most relevant stuff to them, just shown to them at the specific time that they want to see it before they even have to think about it. And I think, the caveat to that is the more data that you provide somebody or a company, the easier it is for them to do that. But if you want your privacy, it's probably not going to be as good as you're hoping for. Does that like, what are your thoughts around that? Do are you agree with me or, or like, is it getting easier to do that? Or, or what's your thoughts around that? Yeah, I, th I think, well, you know, we're going to start to see, you know, there'll be a, a midpoint where, yeah, you know, consumers will be dissatisfied with not getting the, the levels of, you know, sort of recommendations and right. dyna dynamic service, and then you'll see a rise of applications and and services that provide you know better double opt in capabilities, um, which are, are privacy secure and protected. And so I think you're seeing you know Google with its sandbox. That's what it's trying to do. Right. Um, and then consumers will choose. They'll, they'll, you know, they're fickle creatures. Yeah, you know, the people that we serve as, as, as consumers. Sure. Um, when they see the value, they'll, they'll opt into it. Um, but only when they see the value. And so, I, I think we've got to recognize that privacy is not, not absolute. You know, there are, yeah, way, there are, there are ways for us to observe behavior. You know, you, you know, the, the old, you know, sort of adage of you know your behavior speaks you know louder than your actions and um that's the same on the web if i can if i can perceive you as an individual um i don't always need a unique identifier to do that um i can do that with machine learning and lookalike models i can do it um you know really with you know bringing more data to the equation um right. but so it's a it's an interesting time yeah. The other thing that I think is interesting too is it's how much you like or trust a brand. And like, I'll give you a personal example. Like I try to give Facebook as little data as possible because I don't trust them as a brand, but somebody like Google and Apple, I'm totally fine giving them almost like all of my data, you know? And it's, it's, it's interesting. I think more and more people are thinking about that stuff too, where it could be so brand specific, right? Have you seen that? It, you, that is, it's super astute because I, I think we're, we're living in a world of trust and we're living in a world where the, the, the choices that we make and the companies that we choose to work with and buy products from is going to be based on alignment to our principles and the trust that we, we have. And so you will have um, you know, you know, alignment based on that. And I suspect uh, just what you said, the Googles and the Apples will win because they're, they're putting purpose and, and meaning into, into that experience. I have seen during COVID, people will select brands and we've seen it from our own data uh, that the brands that they trust more, just simply. So, you know, Microsoft has won uh, in enterprise 
and has been helping in transformation and is you know achieving significantly more you know sort of cloud revenues as a consequence of that um you know and you know netflix you know people are going there not only because it's a great service but it has um you know it's a really fundamental need for for entertainment and they trust the product so there's a lot of winners um the more that you can you can build purpose and meaning into your brand the the more trustworthy you are and transparent about how you're acquiring how you're using data um and ultimately the the controls that you're you're putting in place um i think people will be more willing to share with you um you know it's like a good friend if i if i if i ultimately tell you um who i am and i'm honest about it yeah you know, it's it's a it's a different world yeah, no, that that makes a lot of sense. The other thing, too, that I think is really interesting about all this stuff is how much data we really have at our fingertips nowadays as kind of a consumer, because I'm sure a lot of people, when they're even in a physical store or they're online, they're checking prices on other websites or when they're standing in front of something physically, there might be like, well, I'm going to look at this online or look at the reviews online. How have you seen data kind of change and mold people's decisions as well as um, tying those to specific brands and, and how people are kind of changing their mindset around just being a consumer? Yeah. I mean, look at Amazon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you go into Best Buy and you, you're looking to buy a, a cable and you pull out your phone and you, you kind of showroom in Best Buy. They're doing a great job in, in you know, basically doing the last mile for uh, someone who's got a better supply chain and has the ability to, to you know, beat them on price because they don't have the same, the same overhead. And we've fundamentally seen retail transform um, and think about where like COVID, everything's yeah. gone, gone direct. You know, so we've had businesses that traditionally, um, you know, would have struggled to do that. You know, your local butcher is selling direct now and delivering to you. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the guys that are catching, um, you know, salmon off the coast have got now a D to C brand. And so they, they all need the, to be able to enable those, those moments, which were just traditional business moments with data so they can actually sell to customers to track them, to understand their, their, their satisfaction. Um, and that's, that's a brand moment. You know, yeah, everything that we're doing right now is about, you know, building trust, meaning and purpose with the customers that we serve. And so you have to be able to measure that in some meaningful way that goes beyond that, that last click. Um, you know, and, you know, as the, the, the rise of this contextual based marketing happens, it just becomes more and more important. Um, and so, you know, we, we're, we're really excited by the space. Um, you know, we know that there's a, there's a, there's a huge problem out there as more people become brand savvy <laughs> where they haven't yeah. had to be. Um, they're going to, they're going to, they're going to need help. They're going to need to know what to do. And so, um, you know, you need to be able to understand what your, the market is, what your competitors are doing, um, how much are they spending? Yeah, uh, where should I start? You know, should I start with digital? Should I start with, you know, um, advertising? Should I build a better product? Where are the deficiencies? Um, all of those questions are available when you when you think about uh, the answers to those questions are available when you when you look at you versus your competitors and put yourself in context. Interesting. So, have you seen brands? that are either been around a long time or just starting out leverage data or how do they leverage data similarly or different based on, because a lot of times they're always trying to reposition, right? I think, and, and try to obviously get market share and that usually comes for their, from their competitors. So how do you see kind of new brands leveraging data almost like, they're trying to reposition themselves and how have you seen kind of new companies leverage data to figure out where they could fit into that market or a new market? It's yeah, it's uh, we've, we've seen it uh, across the board. So, you know, it just depends on your life cycle. So if you're a new company, traditionally what we've seen 
is that you you have this groundswell and you know we we see that in one of our measures in in reverence usually means people love you they're talking about you there's real positive sentiment around um, your products and your brand but you have low familiarity people don't right. know who you, they don't know who you are um, so you know that's that's typically of a of a you know a startup or a, a new entrant or a fast moving entrant into a category. When you look at um, you know more well established companies like the market leader in the category, really well known, very hard to hang on to uh, the reverence. So familiarity breeds contempt when you right. think about, when you think about that measure. But what they're trying to do is create space relative to their competitors, and how do they do that? You know, when well-established companies do this, what they're looking at is messaging and positioning. And ultimately, okay. um, you know, we we measure that in uniqueness. So let's talk about an example. So, you know, if I'm um, a technology brand and, you know, I make um, a laptop and, you know, I'm not going to talk about feeds and speeds. You know, everyone's a, is, is talking about feeds and speeds and, you know, how fast it is. Um, I may come out with a, another product that is design led, that is completely emotional, um, that you know connects with audiences in a different way. And why do I do that? Is because I'm trying to create space in the category for me to charge better prices, um, to get, you know, to market faster and get better demand. That that holds true totally even in places like detergent. So if you think about, you know, Dawn versus method soap, you know, Dawn right. is the the rational leader all about effectiveness, cuts through grease. Method is fundamentally about my life. It fits into my life. And it, it's a design product. It's beautiful. Uh, it's environmental um, at its core. And they do that to, to create space again uh, relative to each other. And so that's happening all the time. Now, imagine if I could see that in real time. Sure. Yeah. What does that allow you to do? It allows you to, you know, position ahead of your competitors. Um, if you're seeing changes in spend, big spend uh, fluctuations, you know, early signals that there's competitive movement. And so there, there's that dynamic that's happening at the category level, which is really interesting to watch. Um, and, and it's available. It, the data is out there because you know brands are actively making moves every day. We just often don't have the width in which to see it. And so, you know, um, that's that's been the exciting piece of, you know, how I've seen you know really large companies uh, use sure. use the data. They use it for competitive intelligence. New fast moving entrants, you know, they're very interested in you know kind of, well, how do I get some of the discipline that's coming from the the incumbents, the the very large companies, and how do I I use the the best of what they're doing to catch up um, and then accelerate. And so, you know, there's there's competitive information there's the spend data and there's this positioning. And so, you know, you can make active choices um, using that. Yeah, no, that that's actually really interesting. And I know like big brands are always like Pepsi and Coke, for example, they're obviously want to know what the other one's doing. Right. And if there's a new, this is a bad example, but like sugar comes to market or, or some other ingredient that they could use in another like soda. Well, they probably want to try to be on it before their competitor or at least launch around the same time or try to figure out like, oh, they're spending a bunch of money. Maybe they're launching a new product around whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Well, think about sustainability, right? There's a huge, like that's a, that's yeah. a, huge, that's a huge topic, right? Every brand um, has, has a mission to, to leave the planet in a better place than they, they ultimately, they arrived on it. Um, how do you measure that? You know, how yeah. sustainable is your brand? Um, how how sustainable am I relative to my competitors? Does that create competitive advantage? And so, you know, thematic analysis is is a really important area that you know we think you know we we take a lot of time to do because what it does is it gives you uh, early indicators and and competitive advantage if you're ahead of that market. Um, you know, what's the right time to pace that in? Um, you know, so there's, there's a lot of that work that goes on. The other thing is think about what's going on with COVID, right? We've, yeah. we've, you know, we're living in a time where, you know, how brands respond to that is, is critical. You know, it's, sure. um, you know, you can't, you can't be just trying to solve the problem. Um, 
you know, you need to take a, a much wider kind of stance in, in the market. And that means understanding how your brand fits into, into that context, um, making sure that you have empathy and, and you actually understand what's going on in people's lives. Sure. Uh, and then positioning your portfolio appropriately. So, you know, don't lead with, um, you know, transactional products. Think about how I can solve collaboration, how I can improve productivity, how I can connect people. Um, and there's companies that have done a really good job of that. You know, um, you know, Salesforce did that in, um, in, the, in sort of mid-market, trying to help bring small business back. ServiceNow actually used their own customers um, and let their customers lead other customers onto the platform and um, help them solve problems, you know, on the front line. So there's, there's tons of examples of, you know, doing the right thing with your brand and using data to inform those decisions. Um, but, you know, having the ability to put your head up and look over the parapet um, is, is important. <laughs> no, and, fair. Yeah. The, the other thing that I think is interesting too is it's obviously really easy to claim whatever you want to claim, good, bad, other, it doesn't matter. But when you have the data to actually back it up, you can say like, look, we tried to do this and we succeeded by X and like, here's the data to prove it, right? And you could almost turn some of the learnings that you get from data into another marketing campaign or just getting the good you're doing in the world out there and it's actually backed up by data right and i i know you can sometimes skew things however you want it to but if you really put it out there and you're really true about we tried this this worked now we're more eco-friendly by 10 percent or whatever that's a big deal and you want to promote that right yeah. I mean, I think empirical evidence, you know, we, we think about the world that, yeah, I totally agree with you, Kevin, when you think about, you know, ultimately what you want to be able to do is say, I'm going to take an action. Um, I want to see what the impact was and should we continue doing that? And, you know, marketers uh, and people that run, run companies and brands are really have been largely instinct based. They have, they have hunches, they go and do it. Um, and then they hope they're right. You know, so great examples, you know, you go and you speak to social media people and they'll say to you, oh, look, less is more. And that's just not true, right? It's it's just yeah. not, it's not true. Yeah. It, what, what, what's true is more is more in social. And, you know, we, we say, we just replicate problems that, that just are not real. And, you know, ultimately when we're thinking about, um, you know, data, you want to, you want to make sure that you, you're using it to inform your strategies that you're you are you know, learning from yourself constantly um, and that you're, you're sharing that knowledge because it, it's, it's super valuable. And it, it, when you, when you do good things, absolutely you should amplify them, you know, like Satya at uh, Microsoft, you know, he's putting 25 million people back to work. Yeah. That's I mean, it's amazing. Yeah. You know, it's, it's this renaissance of, um, you know, businesses with purpose, in the communities that they serve beyond just the products that they make. And it's, it's just awesome to see what's going on at the moment. No, I, I hundred percent agree. I, I think it, it's, we're in like, obviously there's a ton of negative going on and I don't want to downplay that at all, but I think there is a lot of positivity coming from companies, right. And they're starting to care a lot more about, their people and and actually doing good in the world where i think arguably a few years ago even some companies it wasn't even really on their radar yeah i mean think about it. i mean we've had we've allowed companies to um focus on profit and yeah. being driven by that i'm not saying we, we should we should stop being commercial uh you know commercially minded and be making you know money from from actually selling services or products you you should do that but you should also have a, a wider stance um from a, a strategy perspective and understanding that you have a responsibility to the community that you serve um and you know when we when we make technology that you know you know reduces um you know kind of employment yeah you know, we should replace that we should have the next job you know, we should be finding ways to educate and to 
to help people back into into the environment to to do more and to create more and so you know we i think we're starting to see a, a rising consciousness I, I think that's the that's the silver lining of of covid i think is that it's put a bit more empathy back into you know a very very commercially minded um kind of environment and i i think that's that's only going to be good for us um i think we're going to value the human condition um more than we ever have you know those connections those moments the the times to be able to sit together um and we're gonna we're gonna they're gonna be premium you know you're gonna, you're gonna be able to charge more as a consequence of creating those moments yeah well and i also think you build better brand loyalty so people are likely to come back and sure maybe you don't get the most out of them day one, but if they're a if they stay for years, like Apple is the perfect of this. It's like Apple could say, like right now, this second, a pub like a thing that says like a marketing message to all their social media that was like, This Monday, we're launching a product, it's gonna be five hundred dollars. Pre-orders are today. Say nothing else. There will be a ton of people, myself included, that would pre-order that thing just because <laughs> right because of that brand loyalty and you trust me, right where, where not a lot of brands can say that right and so i think we're it's an interesting time where you know brands can leverage data to do some of this cool stuff and and build these long-term customers that will keep coming back yeah i think um you know what you just you just said is it, it, it goes back to that trust and you think about what Apple's done, you know, they're, they're an emotionally driven brand that builds great products that are simple and easy to use and uh, that fit into your life and make you stand for something. And, you know, I think everyone aspires, aspires to that. We, we had one of our team members who went from a PC to a Mac actually just this week, believe it or not. Um, and he was like, I cannot believe how easy this product is to use and how simple it is and it, it just works you know and so you know having a product mindset uh, is important and then making sure that you you ultimately can deliver that consistent experience over and over again builds loyalty it builds trust and it, it just allows you to you know ultimately tap into to more audiences and build more value um so yeah totally agree no, interesting. But sadly, we're kind of coming to the end of the show. So how about we close with mentioning where people can get more information about yourself and uh, Blue Ocean? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you can you can just log on to the web and just go to www.blueocean.ai. Um, and you know, feel free to, to hit the contact us and that'll get to me. And I'm happy to, to help or answer any questions. Um, you know, we're really excited about, you know, changing the way that marketing's done and, you know, we really appreciate the opportunity to spend time with you, Kevin. Um, you know, you've got such a great show and we really enjoy being here. Thanks, man. I really appreciate it. Um, I look forward to keeping in touch with you and have a good rest of your day. Thanks, Kevin. See you soon. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Thanks for listening. Please visit our website at buildingthefutureshow.com to join the free community. Sign up for our newsletter or to sponsor the show. The music is done by Electric Mantra. You can check him out at electricmantra.com and keep building the future. <laughs>